For someone who's getting started on their AWS security journey, if there's one service that I would recommend that they learn very well, it would be CloudTrail. AWS CloudTrail is such an important service because it gives you visibility into your AWS account activity, and without visibility, you don't have security. This is a key aspect of security and operational best practices in the cloud, and frankly, also outside the cloud, but that's not what we're talking about today. So if you're serious about learning AWS security, then you're in the right place, and let's take a closer look at what this course will teach you. Before we do that though, let me go ahead and share just a little bit about me and who I am and why you should take this course. Hi, I'm Christoph Limpelair, and I'm the founder and an author of Cyber, where I've published many courses on topics of cloud security and ethical hacking. You may also know me from Linux Academy, where I taught multiple AWS courses, including AWS certification courses. I taught for the AWS Certified Developer, AWS Certified SysOps, the Certified DevOps Engineer Professional, and the AWS Cloud Practitioner Certifications. While there, I also helped build, manage, and secure production AWS infrastructure that ran as a million dollar a year budget. Through that and other experiences, I learned how to properly design and secure AWS environments and resources. All that to say, I have years of experience working in AWS and building as well as securing production environments, and I'm now working on sharing my experiences in this course and other courses to help you secure your own AWS resources. But for more details about my background, check out my LinkedIn profile and feel free to connect. This course is designed for anyone, regardless of current skill level, to be able to walk away with a thorough understanding of what CloudTrail is, how it can be used, and how you should configure it to get maximum observability in your AWS environments, depending on your specific use case. We start off by explaining what data CloudTrail is able to collect and log, depending on how it's configured. There is a common misunderstanding between logging management, data, or insights events. And when you create a brand new AWS account, by default, only management events get collected, and this can be a problem that we'll explore in detail. In addition, CloudTrail offers three primary ways of recording data, and each of those ways have pros and cons that are important to understand, and so we will also cover those topics. Then, we jump into the AWS console to learn how to work with event history, to create our first trail, to work with trails, work with pushing logs to CloudWatch for analytics, monitoring, and alerting. We'll also work with CloudTrail Insights to detect unusual activity, and we'll learn how to use CloudTrail Lake for auditing, for security investigation, and operational troubleshooting. We will then wrap up the course by explaining how to secure our CloudTrail deployments and log files by using IAM, by using log file integrity, encryption, and a checklist of security best practices. So by the end of this course, you will feel confident in deploying CloudTrail for production environments, and you'll be ready to learn more advanced topics like threat hunting and investigating security events, which we will teach in a separate course. If you have any questions about this course, please feel free to reach out in our community, but otherwise, I hope you're excited to get started, and I'll see you in the course. Welcome to Cyber's Getting Started with CloudTrail course. To get things started, let's talk about what this service offers and why it's so important to understand. With CloudTrail, you can view, you can search, download, archive, analyze, and respond to account activity across either a single region in your account, multiple regions, or even multiple accounts. They can be configured to collect logs from multiple different sources, giving you a complete history of events and API calls that are made within your AWS account by sources like the console, the SDKs, CLI, and AWS services. This includes AWS API calls, as well as additional non-API events like console logins, which is practically all the actions across your AWS infrastructure. You can then use those logs to audit your AWS account, and it provides a very useful source for monitoring simple or even large and complex AWS environments for suspicious or potentially dangerous actions. If something weird is going on in your account, especially if it's a security-related event, but also operational issues, then CloudTrail's data should probably be one of the first, if not the first, places that you investigate, and we'll talk more about how to do that later on in this course. It is a service that helps you answer important questions like who took this action and when, what resources did they access or modify, 
what events happened during a certain time frame, etc. As an example of this, if I make a change to an EC2 instance, even if that change was made through the AWS console, it's still making calls to the AWS API, which means that CloudTrail would be able to see it and log it. And you can find out information like the identity of the API caller, the time of the API call, the source IP address of the API caller, the request parameters, and response elements that are returned by the AWS service. However, it is important to understand that all of that functionality that we just mentioned is not enabled by default. Whenever you create a new AWS account, a limited version of CloudTrail is automatically enabled on your behalf. That limited version only logs management events and not data events or insights events. We'll learn more about what this means in other lessons because this is a very important topic to understand. Now by default, CloudTrail also doesn't get enabled with any trails. Instead, the management events get stored for up to 90 days in what they call event history. There are ways of storing data for longer than that, which we will also be exploring, but as one of the first steps, you'll want to generate CloudTrail trails and I'll show you exactly how to do that. Let's take a look at some actual examples of what CloudTrail can log and why it's important. One of the most important events that you need to keep track of is console sign-in events. CloudTrail can log any attempts to sign into the AWS Management Console, both successful and failed. In this way, you can identify brute force attempts or suspicious logins that took place after hours, and you can confirm that all logins are using multi-factor authentication. Remember that your console is your most critical asset. Anyone with access to your console can potentially do a lot of damage. You can also set up monitoring and alerting for any time someone logs in using your root account because root accounts should almost never be used. And so if someone is using one, you should get notified and you can use CloudTrail's logs in order to do that. CloudTrail also has the ability to log changes to security groups as another example. A change in security group can introduce, even by accident, a security hole in your AWS environment. And so you should monitor these changes very closely and ensure that they occur as part of a change management process. Apart from security groups, it is important to keep track of several changes that may occur in your VPCs and can potentially have a security impact. Unauthorized changes to NACLs and route tables could be indicators of compromise. Even if they're made on purpose, changes like these can have a negative impact on the security posture of your AWS environment, and so you should definitely keep an eye on those changes. And these are just a handful of practical examples, but as we will see in this course, there are many more applications. But now that we've gotten an overview of what CloudTrail is, how it works, and when it's useful, we're ready to move on to the next lesson. There's a very big difference between logging management events, data events, and insights events. Management events logging is what's enabled by default when you create a new AWS account. It's very helpful, but a lot of people misunderstand and believe that it logs more than it actually does. And if they don't understand this and they don't enable data events and then a security incident happens, they may be left completely blind as to what's going on because they're not getting the data that they needed. And even if they do go in and enable additional logging because they think that an incident occurred, they won't be able to see back in time. They will only see what's happening now and then in the future. So unless the attack is still ongoing, they probably won't get any useful information that they can then use to investigate the incident unless they're able to get that from some other service. And that's why this lesson is so important and we need to cover this topic before we go in and actually configure CloudTrail. So let's start by deep diving into what management events are and what they cover. Management events capture operations that are performed on resources in your AWS account. This is referred to as control plane operations. A plane is a term used in IT that comes from networking and it's used to refer to what layer the operation occurs in. AWS separates most services into either the control plane or the data plane. The control plane refers to administrative API operations like creating, reading, updating, deleting, and listing resources. As an example, launching an EC2 instance or creating an S3 bucket is an action in the control plane, and so that would be logged as part of management events in CloudTrail. Some other examples include configuring security, for example, using the IAM attach role policy API operation, Another example would be registering devices, like for example with Amazon EC2, the create default VPC API operations, or configuring rules for routing data, 
Again, in Amazon EC2, this could be create subnet API operations. And for the final example, we could be talking about setting up logging. So with AWS CloudTrail, the create trail API operation. Management events can also include non-API events in your AWS account. Non-API events include AWS service events, which are events that are created by AWS services, but they're not directly triggered by a request that you made to a public AWS API, with an example of this being when a customer managed key is automatically rotated in AWS KMS, or AWS Management Console sign-in events, and examples include successfully or unsuccessfully signing in as an IAM user or as a root user. It could even be a root user changing their password or changing their MFA settings, etc. For more examples like these, please refer to this page in the AWS documentation. So this is all considered to be part of the control plane and part of what gets logged in management events by CloudTrail. Data events, on the other hand, are not enabled by default unless you go into the CloudTrail service and configure it to specifically log them, then CloudTrail will completely ignore this data. The reason for this is that AWS charges more for logging this type of data, and you can view pricing information on this page. Data events provide visibility into the resource operations that are performed on or within a resource, which is referred to as data plane operations. Because AWS can change this at any time, I'd recommend that you refer to their documentation for an up-to-date and comprehensive list of what all this covers. But some examples include Amazon DynamoDB, where you have object level API activity in the DynamoDB tables, like put item, delete item, etc. AWS Lambda, where you have function execution activity via the invoke API. Amazon S3 object level API activity, like get object, put object, delete object, etc., on the buckets and objects within the buckets. Even AWS CloudTrail itself, with the put audit events activity on a CloudTrail Lake channel. And as you can see here, there are many more. So, whereas management event data would log S3 account level actions, like the following that we see here, and it would also log S3 bucket level actions like create bucket, delete bucket, things like that. Data events data would log object level actions like copy object, delete object, get object, list objects, and so on. So this type of data will not get logged unless you enable this functionality. You would need to create a trail and then create an event data store, which we'll see how to do in the next section. And so now you can see why understanding this distinction is so important. If a security incident occurs that involves exfiltrated sensitive S3 data and you only have management events enabled, you could completely miss the entire issue and you won't have any useful data to investigate what actually happened. Of course, the downside to consider is cost, and that is something that you or your organization has to decide on. Finally, let's talk about insights events. Whereas management events and data events give the ability to capture data from two different planes, insights events help you identify and respond to unusual activity that's associated with API calls and API error rates. It does this by constantly analyzing CloudTrail management events and by creating a baseline of normal patterns and then generating insights events whenever the call volume or error rates go outside of that normal pattern. As an example, if your AWS account normally gets fewer than one or two access denied exception errors in a seven day period on the AWS IAM API call of create user, but then out of nowhere, you start logging an average of 15 errors per minute, then an insights event would get logged at the start of the unusual error rate activity. And then another insights event would get logged to mark the end of that unusual activity. So this feature essentially focuses on giving you actionable insights based on management data, and it provides relevant information that you can use for an investigation, such as the associated API, the error code, the incident time, and overall statistics. CloudTrail Insights is not enabled by default, and they are an extra charge, but I'll show you how to enable and use them in the next section. Once they are enabled and CloudTrail detects unusual activity, it will deliver those events to your destination S3 bucket. 
And this is another key difference because Insights event logs will only get delivered whenever an unusual activity is detected. You can also view the information from the CloudTrail console and you can configure CloudTrail to send Insights events to CloudWatch logs, or you can create a rule in Amazon EventBridge to deliver Insights events. Both of those approaches could be used to generate an email or SMS notification whenever an Insights event is generated so that you can investigate. So we've covered quite a bit of important information in this lesson. So feel free to either go back through it another time or use the sources that I've included in the transcript to make sure that you have a solid grasp of what gets logged by management events versus data events versus insights events. Then go ahead and complete this lesson and let's move on to the next. We've just learned about how CloudTrail can log different types of data. Now let's talk about the three ways that it has to record this data. The first way is event history, the second is Trails, and the third is CloudTrail Lake. The event history in CloudTrail is enabled by default whenever you create an AWS account. This gives you viewable, searchable, and downloadable records of the past 90 days for management events in an AWS region. These records are immutable, meaning that they can't be modified by anyone once they've been generated. And this is very important because it means you can trust the data hasn't been tampered with after it was recorded. And the best part about event history is that it's completely free. In the next section of working with CloudTrail, we'll actually start by looking at event history and how we can use it. But next, and this is what most people know about CloudTrail because it's a core function of the service, we can record data by creating trails. So we'll take a look at how to create our first trail very soon in the next section, but it is important to understand that trails are what capture records of AWS activities that you can then store in Amazon S3 instead of just in event history or just for management events. We talked about how management events are stored for 90 days in event history, and you can create a trail to store those management events in a more permanent S3 bucket so that you don't lose valuable data after that 90 days. Data events and insights events can also be logged by trails if you configure that. So if you are interested in more than just management events, then creating a trail would be a great way of doing that. You can create an Amazon S3 bucket, you specify that bucket when you create a new trail, and the service will automatically deliver logs to that bucket. On top of that, you can optionally send logs to CloudWatch logs by creating a log group, and you can also create Amazon Event Bridge rules that use information from CloudTrail. We'll talk more about why all of this is important later on with examples, but while you don't get charged by AWS for storing one copy of ongoing management events to an S3 bucket, you do get charged the S3 storage charges, which are quite minimal, but that is important to keep in mind. You also get charged for data events that do get delivered to S3 from a trail. The third way of recording CloudTrail data is called CloudTrail Lake. Lake is a feature that lets you store, access, and analyze activity for audit and for security purposes using a SQL-based query language. With Lake, the events get stored into what's called Event Data Store, and you can even import existing CloudTrail logs from your S3 buckets into an event data store. You can use event data stores to log CloudTrail management and data events, and you can also store AWS config configuration items, AWS audit manager evidence, or other non-AWS events from third-party integrations. These event data stores are immutable collections of event data, and you can choose exactly what data you want to store by configuring what's called event selectors. An added benefit of using Lake is that it provides integrations which you can use to log and store activity data from outside of Amazon Web Services. It could be a source from your on-prem VMs and containers or even SaaS applications. Once the data is in Lake, you can query the event data using advanced SQL queries across multiple event fields, which is a lot more powerful than you can do with event history. You can even visualize CloudTrail data by creating lake dashboards where each dashboard can be made up of multiple different widgets that represent a SQL query. Now, while lake is pretty awesome and we'll take a look at it, my main gripe with it is that it can become very expensive if you have a lot of data. Check out the pricing page for more details, but at a high level, you get charged for data ingestion and storage as well as data analysis. 
Now, as we wrap up this lesson, I saved an important bit of information for the end. Keep in mind that Cottrail is not considered to be real-time logging because even AWS themselves will tell you that Cloudtrail typically delivers events within an average of about five minutes of an API call, and this time is not guaranteed. So yes, there can be a bit of a delay from the moment that you or an attacker makes an API call to the moment that you're even able to see it and or receive an alert. And if you need to know more information about this, then please check out their service level agreement. All right, that now covers the three different ways that Cloudtrail records data. So let's complete this lesson and let's move on to the next. As we've talked about, part of Cloudtrail is enabled by default when you create an AWS account, and that part includes enabling event history. Event history gives us 90 days of storage for collected management events, and it's a feature that we can use to view, to search, and download these records. Let's take a look at how we can do that in the AWS console. First, navigate over to AWS Cloudtrail. From there, click on Event History in the left menu. Then, you can search events in Event History by filtering for events on a single attribute. Let's take a look at an example. Let's say that you want to see who recently made changes to a specific security group. For the filter, select Resource Name. Then, for the search value, you'll want to input the security group ID. Now, I've got one saved already, but if you didn't, then you'd want to look up the security group ID, copy and paste it directly in this box. You can then enter a time range if you want, and if you do, you can click on apply. After that, you can click on the individual events to pull up more details about the event. And if you click on view event record, you will see the exact JSON record with even more information. It will show you who made the change with the principal ID and ARN, with which access key they made the change by looking at the access key ID, when with event time, and what the changes were with the request parameters. Closing out of that, if you select multiple events, they will show up side by side in the table so that you can compare values. You can click on the event name hyperlink, which will take you to a page view that's dedicated to this event. And if we go back to the main event history view, from there, we can download events as either CSV or JSON formats. And we can also create something called an Athena table, which we're not going to demonstrate in this lesson. The last thing that I'll mention before we move on is that you can customize this table and you can see that by clicking on the cog icon where you can then enable or disable the visible columns that we have. And you can even change how many events are shown per page as well as some other settings. Now, of course, AWS CloudTrail exposes a public API, so we don't just have to use it through the AWS console. We can also query it through the AWS CLI using the AWS CloudTrail lookup events. Let's take a look at some examples of how we can use this. Make sure you have the AWS CLI installed, and I recommend using the AWS CLI version 2, but version 1 will also work. If you don't already have the AWS CLI installed, which you can check by opening up your terminal and typing in AWS help, and if that opens up the help menu, then you have the CLI installed and then you can proceed. You can type Q to exit out of this menu. But if you get an error and you don't see this, then please check out this page for instructions on how to install the CLI and then come back here. Now to see a list of the latest event, you can type in the command of AWS CloudTrail lookup dash events, and then you can pass in a parameter of max items of one, and then I'll use output of JSON in order to make the output more legible. And you should see something like this. We get back a result with data that contains an event ID, an event name, event time, event source, and a CloudTrail event that's full of information. If you'd like a list of all the output fields and what they mean, then please check out this page in the documentation. Instead of specifying a maximum limit for items returned, we can also specify a time range by using a start time and by using an end time. These timestamps can take Unix time values, where you can also specify the date, the month, and year values separated by forward slashes or even hyphens and spaces. So for example, we could do something like this. As we see, we have a lot of results here. And then after that, we can also query by using a single attribute, just like we did in the AWS console. The way that we would do that is by using the parameter of lookup attributes. 
then we would give it a key value pair by using attribute key equals and then the attribute, which we'll come back to in a second, and then comma attribute value equals the value that you're searching for. So again, this is a key value pair. So you'd specify both the key and the value. And for the attribute key, we can use any of these values that you see here. We have access key ID, event ID, event name, event source, read only, resource name, resource type, and even username. So as a practical use case, let's say that you think that an access key has potentially been compromised and has been used by a threat actor. You can query the last 10 events that are related to that access key by using the following command. Or if you believe that a role has been used for malicious purposes, you can search for events that are related specifically to that role. And in this case, you would change the attribute key to resource name and the attribute value to the name of the role. As another similar example, you can also search for events related to specific users by using the username attribute key. So again, we would change it to username, and then for the attribute value, you would type in the username itself. For example, we could use Christoph here, which would be a username in my AWS environment. Apart from using the CLI, we can also make API calls via scripts, applications, or third-party software. Like if we're using the AWS SDK for .NET, for Java, JavaScript, Python, etc., we can use this API. It's very similar to what we just saw talking about the CLI because they use the same API. But if you want more information, then check out this documentation page. There are a few important facts to keep in mind when we're using event history. Number one, when you're using the AWS console, you can only view management events. You do not see data events, even if they're enabled. Number two, it only stores data for up to 90 days, and then you lose that data permanently. Number three, you can only use it to search data from a single account, and it will only return events from a single AWS region. Number four, you can't query multiple different attributes. So unlike with CloudTrail Lake, which we'll talk about later, searchability is going to be very limited. And finally, number five, you cannot exclude AWS KMS or Amazon RDS data API events. Sometimes you'll want to hide that information for security purposes. In this case, you wouldn't be able to do that. Overall, event history can give you a good starting point and it can be useful when you need to run simple queries against your data. It can give you a good starting point for security or troubleshooting investigations, but you will likely get to a point where you find it too limiting and that's when you can turn to something like CloudTrail Lake or CloudWatch Logs Insights or even Athena. Also, considering some of event history's limitations, especially the maximum of 90 days of storage and the lack of customization, you'll want to consider creating one or more trails to overcome those limitations. But with that, let's complete this lesson so that we can move on and learn more. Now that we've seen event history being used in action and we understand its limitations, we need to take a look at how we can create trails. Let's pull up CloudTrail in the AWS console. From there, we can click on create a trail and we'll give this trail a name like cyber sample trail and then we'll create it. Click on your newly created trail and let's edit the general details. You'll notice that I have a grayed out option that says enable for all accounts in my organization. This is a super helpful feature if you're using AWS organizations, but in my case, I'm actually using a child account that's part of my parent organization, which is why this is grayed out. But in any case, the quick start approach to creating a new trail automatically creates a new bucket in S3 with a unique name. You can always change this to one of your existing buckets if you already have one. We can also enable log file encryption using SSE-KMS, and we already know what that means because we learned about it earlier in the course. The quick start approach disables this by default, but otherwise this feature is actually enabled by default. And if we were to enable it now, it would ask us to either create a new key or use an existing one. This is recommended for production, but I'm not going to do that right now. We also have a checkbox to enable log file validation, but again, you would normally want to enable this for production reasons, but here I'll leave it off for this example. Next, we have the ability to enable SNS notification delivery, which would notify you each and every time that a log file is delivered to your bucket. This is not very practical for most people and would result in a bunch of notifications. So instead, it's generally better to enable notifications only for very important events. If you make modifications here, then go ahead and save changes. But otherwise, like in my case, I'm just gonna cancel out. 
and congratulations, you've now successfully created your very first CloudTrail trail. From this dashboard, you can see general information about this trail, including that this is a multi-region trail, meaning that it will log events across all regions in your AWS account. As a quick aside, AWS's documentation says that to log events across all regions in all AWS partitions in your account, create a multi-region trail in each partition. If you're not familiar with partitions, AWS currently offers three of them. The first one is an AWS partition for AWS regions. The second is an AWS CN partition for China. And the third is an AWS US Gov partition for AWS Gov Cloud US regions. All that to say, unless you're in China or you're using a GovCloud AWS account, then this does not apply to you. All you need to know is that you either create individual trails per region or you enable multi-region trails to automatically do that for you. Now, before we wrap up, let's head over to Amazon S3 so that we can see the bucket that was created for us. If we click on that bucket, we should already see some AWS logs. You can go ahead and open up those directories until you see a few different objects. As you can see here, we already have some log files. The problem though, is that these are compressed files, which means that we would have to download them, extract them, and then sift through a bunch of hard to read information. And that's why you would wanna use something else like CloudWatch Logs, CloudTrail Lake, Athena, or even a third party tool in order to query this data. And we will take a look at some of that in the following lessons. But for now, let's complete this lesson and I'll see you in the next. We looked at how we can create a trail using the AWS console and we set up that trail to store files in Amazon S3. In this lesson, let's talk about how to locate log files, how to download them, and then how to search through those files in order to find relevant information. In the prior lesson, we saw where our log files are stored, but we only had a few files created. What about when you had CloudTrail enabled for months? How do you know which files to look for? Well, the log file storage follows a particular path. We start off with a bucket name, followed by a prefix name, AWS logs, account ID, CloudTrail, the actual region, the year, the month, and the date, and then the actual file name, .json, .gz. So you can rely on this format remaining constant, which means that you can use this when you're manually looking for files or if you're writing any sort of software that will ingest those files. And then to download them, you have a few different options. As a first option, you could use a JSON viewer add-on, which is an extension like if you're using Chrome or Firefox in order to open those files directly in your browser or you can download the files from S3 and you can do that by selecting them in the console and then clicking on download. Or you could also of course do this via the CLI or the API. There are also many third-party vendors that let you upload the log files to then be able to process them and analyze them. And you can see what those are on this page. Instead of demonstrating how to use one of these third-party solutions though, let's go ahead and see how we can use our local terminal. So to get started, make sure that you download one of your log files from S3, then open your terminal and install JQ if you don't already have it. There are multiple ways of installing this and you can see them on this instructions page. But for example, on Mac OS, you could use homebrew and type in brew install JQ and I already have it installed, so I'm not going to do this, and I can tell this by typing in which JQ, and you should see a result like this, or something similar. JQ is a lightweight command line tool that we can use to parse, filter, and manipulate JSON data, which is what these log files are made up of. You can navigate to where you've downloaded your log file in the terminal, so for me that's gonna be downloads, then you can cat the log file by typing in the name of the file name. And as you can see, catting this file creates a mess. It's formatted in JSON, but there's no white space at all, so it's really difficult to read. And by the way, if your files did not download extracted already, so if your file name extension doesn't end with .json, but instead ends with .json.gz, then you'll first need to extract the files which you can do with either something like 7-zip or using the gunzip command. It really depends on what operating system you're using, but since you've probably already extracted archives before, I'm not gonna show you how. If you do need help, then please leave a comment below and I'll be happy to help. But since the format is JSON already and we have JQ installed, 
let's actually use it. And to make running the following commands easier, let's create a directory and let's move our file into that new directory and then go into it. So let's start by searching for any and all user identities that we have in this log file. To do that, we can type find then period a dash type of f dash exec of jq. And then we're gonna search through the records array for user identity dot arn. This will search all files in our directory. Then it will run the jq command looking for that user identity arn. Now, please note that this is case sensitive. So if you capitalize the user, for example, then it's not going to find anything. Make sure that you use the correct capitalization in this case. Now we can see our Christoph identity has been returned and the complete ARN for who or what made the call, which in this case is an assumed role. So this is a really helpful starting point, but what other valuable information could we extract from this? Well, let's change our command a little bit by running this instead. We're going to replace searching for just our user identity ARN. And instead, we're going to pass in an array to look for the event time, the source IP address, the user identity again, and then the event name. Submitting this command will return this result. And we can see that we have the event time like we wanted, the source IP address, or in this case, the domain for the service, the AWS service. We have that user identity ARN, which tells us what type of identity it is and then we have the event name. As you can see, this is quite a different approach to using the event history API, and it already gives us more flexibility, but it's also not as user-friendly and it requires terminal experience. If you're not used to working from the terminal, writing scripts, or using something like JQ, then this approach is going to have a learning curve. Even if you are used to it, by the way, as you'll see once we get to the CloudTrail Lake lessons, there are many advantages to using that service instead of doing it this way. But with that said, this option is available and it is a valid way of analyzing your logs. But with that, let's complete this lesson and let's move on to the next. We talked about how CloudTrail has a feature called Insights that can help us make sense of log data. As a quick reminder, Insights uses machine learning to automatically analyze write management events from CloudTrail trails, and it looks for anomalies. It does that by creating baselines of normal and expected behavior, and whenever there's a significant change from that baseline, it then generates an Insight event. Let's see how we can enable this and use this functionality in the AWS console. From the CloudTrail dashboard, you can enable insights either as you're creating a trail or you can go back and edit existing trails to enable this feature. But since we already have a trail created, let's go ahead and edit it. Select your trail and scroll down until you see a section for insights events. From there, click on edit, then select insights events, which will display more options. And this is where you can either decide whether you want to enable this for API call rate, API error rate, or both. Now, because AWS charges for this feature per 100,000 events analyzed per insight type, this can affect the cost. And so that's a decision that you have to make. But for this demo, I'll enable both and then I'll click on save changes. And that's it you've enabled insights for this specific trail. If you have other trails, then you could go in and enable it for those trails as well. And then once you enable it, a few things will happen behind the scenes. First, AWS will automatically start crunching data in the background to create baselines. Then second, if or when CloudTrail detects an anomaly, then it will generate an insight event and it will send it to the S3 bucket that's associated with that trail. And it will do that by creating a separate folder named CloudTrail-Insight. Then it will also send the event to EventBridge. And if you've enabled it, it will send it to the associated CloudWatch Logs group. CloudTrail can start detecting and showing anomalies in the console within 30 minutes, but it could take up to 36 hours when you enable it for the first time. You'll be able to see them in the Insights dashboard by clicking on Insights in the left menu, or also by going back to the main CloudTrail dashboard and finding that panel. Now, instead of waiting 36 hours to produce this video, let me show you some screenshots of what Insights events could look like. Here, we have an Insight event that's generated for an API error rate. Someone or something is attempting to use the get role policy API call, which is an IAM API call 
that an attacker could try to use to get information about the IAM policy that's associated with a role. However, that API call is resulting in an error of no such entity exception, and we can see from the graph that normally we get zero to maybe two responses that look like that for hours at a time. But then all of a sudden, we see 18 of these errors in less than a minute. So that tells us that something is going on and it could even just be an operational issue, but maybe it could be a security issue. And either way, this gives us practical information that we can then use to investigate the problem. Here's another example for a different API call of run instances. Instead of this being captured from an API error rate, this is captured by API call rate. So if we had only enabled API error rate when we were configuring our insight settings earlier, then we would not have seen this type of event being generated. So that's important to keep in mind. Beyond graphs, we can also view attribution details as we can see in this screenshot. This page gives us the top user identity ARNs during an event. We also get the top user agents and the top error codes, as well as additional information. Of course, this screenshot is from the AWS console, but we can also query Insights events from other sources, including the Lookup Events API, just like we saw a few lessons ago when we were querying and filtering through the AWS CLI. As you can see, Insights is really easy to implement and it can provide quite a bit of value. The main decision you then have to make is whether it's worth the cost. But that's it. With that, go ahead and complete this lesson and I'll see you in the next. We talked about how CloudTrail has a feature called Insights that can help us make sense of log data. As a quick reminder, Insights uses machine learning to automatically analyze write management events from CloudTrail trails, and it looks for anomalies. It does that by creating baselines of normal and expected behavior, and whenever there's a significant change from that baseline, it then generates an Insight event. Let's see how we can enable this and use this functionality in the AWS console. From the CloudTrail dashboard, you can enable insights either as you're creating a trail or you can go back and edit existing trails to enable this feature. But since we already have a trail created, let's go ahead and edit it. Select your trail and scroll down until you see a section for insights events. From there, click on edit, then select insights events, which will display more options. And this is where you can either decide whether you want to enable this for API call rate, API error rate, or both. Now, because AWS charges for this feature per 100,000 events analyzed per insight type, this can affect the cost. And so that's a decision that you have to make. But for this demo, I'll enable both and then I'll click on save changes. And that's it you've enabled insights for this specific trail. If you have other trails, then you could go in and enable it for those trails as well. And then once you enable it, a few things will happen behind the scenes. First, AWS will automatically start crunching data in the background to create baselines. Then second, if or when CloudTrail detects an anomaly, then it will generate an insight event and it will send it to the S3 bucket that's associated with that trail. And it will do that by creating a separate folder named CloudTrail-Insight. Then it will also send the event to EventBridge. And if you've enabled it, it will send it to the associated CloudWatch Logs group. CloudTrail can start detecting and showing anomalies in the console within 30 minutes, but it could take up to 36 hours when you enable it for the first time. You'll be able to see them in the Insights dashboard by clicking on Insights in the left menu, or also by going back to the main CloudTrail dashboard and finding that panel. Now, instead of waiting 36 hours to produce this video, let me show you some screenshots of what Insights events could look like. Here, we have an Insight event that's generated for an API error rate. Someone or something is attempting to use the get role policy API call, which is an IAM API call that an attacker could try to use to get information about the IAM policy that's associated with a role. However, that API call is resulting in an error of no such entity exception. And we can see from the graph that normally we get zero to maybe two responses that look like that for hours at a time. But then all of a sudden, we see 18 of these errors in less than a minute. So that tells us that something is going on and it could even just be an operational issue, but maybe it could be a security issue. 
And either way, this gives us practical information that we can then use to investigate the problem. Here's another example for a different API call of run instances. Instead of this being captured from an API error rate, this is captured by API call rate. So if we had only enabled API error rate when we were configuring our insight settings earlier, then we would not have seen this type of event being generated. So that's important to keep in mind. Beyond graphs, we can also view attribution details as we can see in this screenshot. This page gives us the top user identity ARNs during an event. We also get the top user agents and the top error codes, as well as additional information. Of course, this screenshot is from the AWS console, but we can also query Insights events from other sources, including the Lookup Events API, just like we saw a few lessons ago when we were querying and filtering through the AWS CLI. As you can see, Insights is really easy to implement and it can provide quite a bit of value. The main decision you then have to make is whether it's worth the cost. But that's it. With that, go ahead and complete this lesson and I'll see you in the next. We've looked at a few ways of querying our data from CloudTrail, but we've seen limitations with each approach. In this lesson, let's get started with CloudTrail Lake. AWS recommends a three-step process to get started. First, create an event data store. Second, run SQL queries. And third, and optionally, add an integration. You'll remember that Lake collects and stores data in event data stores, which is what we can then run our queries against. So let's start by clicking on Create Event Data Store. For the event data store name, you can use whatever you'd like, but I'll just name mine Cyber Demo. We can then choose between pricing options of one year extendable retention pricing or seven year retention pricing. I'll keep the selection to one year. And then below that, you can either keep the default of one year retention period, or you can extend it to three years, 10 years, or even a custom period of less than 10 years. But I'll just keep the default of one year selected. For encryption, we should be using an AWS KMS key as a best practice, but by default, the data is encrypted with an AWS managed KMS key. So I'll leave that disabled for our demo. Next, we can enable Lake Query Federation if we'd like, which lets you run SQL queries against your event data store by using Amazon Athena. I won't enable this for this demo, but feel free to do that if you'd like to play around with using Athena. I'll skip tagging and click on next. On this next screen, we can select the event types that we want to add to our event data store. We can either do AWS events or we can do events from integrations. The second option is if we want to use this for applications that are outside of AWS, such as on-prem. If we keep the selection to AWS events, then we can get access to select between the different types of AWS events that we want to store. We have access to CloudTrail events, CloudTrail Insights events, or even configuration items, where the configuration items option would require that we have AWS config enabled because it works with AWS config. Let's go ahead and select CloudTrail events, and then let's configure the events that we want to capture between management events, data events, copy trail events, or, and this one is grayed out for me, enable for all accounts in my organization, which I can't do because I'm using a member account. By now, we know the difference between management and data events, so I'll leave this selection completely up to you, but I'll go ahead and select only management events. There's also a third option, which is to copy events from an existing S3 bucket. So if you're enabling this after having already collected some data from your trails, then you can go ahead and import those events. And that's what I'll do. I'll select copy trail events in addition to management events, which will instruct CloudTrail to grab a copy of the management data from one of our existing trails. Now, because we're going to be ingesting existing data, I don't need or want to ingest any additional events. And so I'll go ahead and deselect the ingest events option under additional settings, which will prevent this from collecting new data on top of what we're already importing. We then need to select a trail event source and I'll go ahead and select my existing trail. It will pre-populate the S3 location and then we can specify a time range of events. And for this, I'll just go ahead and enter a custom range of one month. I'll leave the default selection of create a new role for choose IAM role, and then I'll enter an IAM role name of Cyber Demo. You can expand the permission policies to view what will get created, and then you can click on next. 
You'll get a warning about pricing because Lake can get expensive if you have a whole lot of data, especially because ingestion is metered on unzipped data, which makes the data quite a bit larger than what you see on the S3 storage. I'm fine with this, so I'll go ahead and check the box that says copy trail events to Lake, and then I'll copy the events. Review your settings and then click on create event data store. On this next dashboard, you'll be able to see general details, what data is included, and the event copy status, where you can keep track of the data ingestion. You really shouldn't have too much data to copy over, so this should finish within just a few minutes. You can keep refreshing until you see it completed. So now that we've created our first event data store, we're ready to run queries against that data. Open up the left menu if it's collapsed, and then click on Query under Lake. From there, you'll be greeted with an Editor tab where you can select the event data store from which you want to run your queries. You can view the event properties that you'd like to use in your query, and then the output of that query. To go ahead and save some time, let's click on the tab that says Sample Queries so that we can use pre-made ones. Feel free to pause here and go through this list to see what all you can run, but I'll go ahead and start off by searching for top APIs aggregated by source. Click on the query name and it will automatically populate our editor with the SQL query. Click on run and give it a few seconds. By default, you'll see the command output tab, but let's go ahead and switch over to the query results tab. In the results, you'll be able to see the event source, the event name, and the API count, and it will be ordered from most API calls to least, which gives you a useful view to understand what API calls are being made the most in your AWS account. Okay, let's go back to sample queries, and this time, let's search for something different. Let's look for investigate manually created resources. Once you find it, click on that, and you'll see this query. Before we run this, let's take a closer look at how it works. We have a select statement where we're selecting the user identity.arn as user, the user identity, the event time, event source, event name, the AWS region, request parameters, resources, request ID, and the event ID. These are the event properties that you can also see and search for in the left bar of this editor. This is one of the very valuable features that we get from Lake because here we can include multiple properties in both our select statement and in the where clause in order to refine our search. Next, we have our event data store ID in the from clause. We then have our where statement, which is filtering for event names that include the word create in them and resources is not null, meaning that the resources property needs to have a value, and the user identity.sessioncontext.sessionissuer.username is not like AWS service role, which is checking to see that the resource was not created by a service linked role, and then checking to see if the user identity.sessioncontext.sessionissuer.username is not null. After that, it's looking to see if the source IP address does not equal cloudformation.amazonaws.com. And this is the part that actually checks whether the resource was created manually or automatically with CloudFormation. And so of course, keep in mind that this could produce false positive if you're not using CloudFormation, but you're using some other form of automation to deploy your resources, but you can modify this query. This is just meant to be a starting point. And then we have an event time filter. Finally, we order the results by event time in descending order. Even if you're not familiar with SQL and querying databases in general, you can see that this is fairly straightforward and mostly self-explanatory. But if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Okay, let's go ahead and run this query. While we wait for the results, I'll point out that you can also check the box that says save results to S3 if you'd like to keep a long-term record of this result. Our query ran successfully, so let's click on the Query Results tab. We'll see a couple of results in here and we can view exactly who made what call, against which service, and so on. In this case, as we can see here, I created KMS grants in the US East One region. This query is practical for a few use cases, including to see if anyone is creating resources outside of the organization's automation tooling, which often leads to issues down the road, including creating shadow IT resources. 
This query could also help from a security perspective because if your account becomes compromised, it's entirely possible that the attacker will create resources manually and not through CloudFormation or whatever other automation you're querying for. You'd be able to see those resources and what was created with this query. As you can see, we're just scratching the surface of what can be done with CloudTrail Lake, but hopefully this gave you a good starting point. Feel free to keep playing around with this feature, and then I recommend deleting your event data store to prevent additional charges, unless you plan on keeping this for future use. To do that, you can go back to Event Data Stores from the Lake menu, then click on the name of your event data store, click on the Actions dropdown, and then Change Termination Protection so that you can select Disabled, and then click on save. You can now click again on actions, and this time you'll click on delete. Now CloudTrail will keep this visible for seven days, after which it gets permanently deleted. But during that time, you can restore it if you made a mistake or if you changed your mind. But that's it. Congrats on creating your first event data store and running queries against it. Go ahead and complete this lesson, and I'll see you in the next. The first topic I'd like to talk about when it comes to protecting our CloudTrail deployment is about monitoring CloudTrail itself. It's important to monitor the CloudTrail service and to keep a log of changes that are made to it. Attackers always want to hide their tracks, so they may attempt to stop the CloudTrail service or to make other modifications. And if that ever happens, you need to not only get notified, but you also need to keep track of those changes. So let's start by talking about what you should be monitoring at a minimum, and then we'll talk about some ways of implementing that. The first API call that we should be monitoring is the stop logging call. If an attacker gets a hold of credentials and starts making API calls against your AWS environments, after doing some simple enumeration, they may try to completely stop CloudTrail from logging data. And one way that they can do that is with the stop logging call. There are very few times that you should be calling this API, so monitoring this should not result in alert fatigue, and it's definitely one that I would recommend keeping an eye on. The next call I'd recommend keeping an eye on is the delete trail call. Instead of just trying to stop a trail from logging, an attacker may try to completely delete it. Again, this is an API call that you most likely won't be using very much, if at all, and so it's the next one that I would watch for. Updating trail settings is definitely something that should not be done that regularly. Typically, this happens almost never once you've set it up, apart from some initial setup, and maybe the occasional change in settings. So it's not a bad idea to monitor the update trail API call to be aware of any changes that were made to your trails, especially because there are a few options that you can pass in to the update trail call that would give cause for concern from a security perspective. We have the no include global service event, which controls whether CloudTrail is collecting events from global services like IAM, we have no is multi-region, which would let an attacker disable multi-region logging and only enable a single region. And then we have no enable log file validation, which would let an attacker disable log file validation. Now before deleting or stopping trail logging, an attacker will need to know what trails, if any, are enabled for an AWS account. They can do that with the describe trails API call, so that could be one that you keep an eye on. This one, however, could lead to generating too many false positives, depending on your use case. So it's completely up to you, but it could be one that you want to monitor. As a good practice, you should also keep an eye on the deregister organization delegated admin call, because this should rarely be happening, especially in your most critical ABS accounts. If someone is attempting to remove CloudTrail delegated administrator permissions from a member account in an organization, then you should definitely be aware of that attempt. And if you're not familiar with delegated administration, this is a useful feature for multi-account setups. Great, so we know that there are API calls that we should monitor, but how exactly do we do that? We've got a few options, but I'll mention two just to get you started. The first one is using the AWS SSK, and the second is using CloudWatch metrics and alarms. The AWS SSK is something you might be familiar with if you took my introduction to AWS Security Course, but if not, it's a free and open source project designed to help deploy the bare minimum security monitoring and alerting that you need for your AWS accounts. And as part of that, it deploys monitoring and alerting for stop logging, delete logging, and update trail. And the way that it does that is by using event bridge rules, as you can see here. 
So by deploying this tool, it would take care of monitoring and alerting for those three API calls, plus a whole lot more that's not necessarily related to CloudTrail. You can then make modifications to the tool in order to monitor and alert for those other API calls that I mentioned. Since this is using EventBridge rules, you have a lot of flexibility here. Otherwise, if you want something simpler and you don't want to deploy the SSK solution, you can build your own alarms from scratch. You can either do that with EventBridge, just like the SSK did, or you can do that using CloudWatch metrics and alarms. Let's take a look at an example. There are a couple of ways that you can do this, but for this example, let's go over to logs and then log groups. Select the CloudTrail log group that you created for this course, and then click on the metric filters tab. From there, click on create metric filter. You have a lot of options for the filter pattern, but let's use this specific pattern, which is going to look for update trail, delete trail, and stop logging. You can then test this pattern against fake data or real data from that specific log group, which is super practical. Go ahead and click on next. Let's give it a name like CloudTrail changes, a metric namespace of CloudTrail metrics, a metric name of CloudTrail changes event count, and then a metric value of one. Click on next, review, and then create metric filter. We then need to create an alarm for this. Select the metric that you just created by clicking on its checkbox and then click on the create alarm button. You'll wanna keep the statistics set to sum and then further down, you'll wanna keep the threshold type to static. You can also keep it set to greater and you can then set the threshold value to zero or you can select greater or equal and set the value to one, completely up to you. On the next page, we wanna make sure that it's set to in alarm. You can then select how to send your SNS notification by either selecting an existing SNS topic if you have one, which I do, so that's what I'll select, or by creating a new topic. On the next page, I'll name my alarm CloudTrail Changes, then I'll click on Next, Review Settings, and then Create the Alarm. Now to test this alarm, let's go over to CloudTrail Dashboard and let's update it by stopping logging on the trail that you created for this course. Select the trail, and click on the stop logging button. You'll need to give CloudWatch about five minutes, but you should then receive a notification and you should be able to click on your new alarm in CloudWatch and then refresh the graph for the data points to populate. If you don't see it yet, or if you don't get the notification, then just give it a few more minutes. All right, so I just received an email alarm notification. And if we refresh this page, we will see that the data point in the graph has been populated and it is in the alarm state. So you now have a few options in your toolkit to monitor for important CloudTrail API calls. Let's go ahead and complete this lesson and let's talk about a few more security best practices for protecting our security logs. If you're not already familiar with it, AWS Identity and Access Management, or IAM for short, is the service that lets you control who can be authenticated and authorized to use your AWS resources, including CloudTrail resources. If you don't get your IAM configurations right, then you will leave your CloudTrail deployments vulnerable. So we need to start there when it comes to securing CloudTrail. And because IAM is such a large and complex service, we will reserve explaining it in more detail for a different course. But for this lesson, let's focus on what you need to know and do for CloudTrail specifically. To get started, let's talk about managing access to the CloudTrail service itself. At the highest level, you will have your AWS admins who can access most or all services and write policies for other users or services. You will then have service administrators who are in charge of CloudTrail resources at your company, and so they will likely have either full access or very close to it to the CloudTrail resources. Then you have service users who may need to use the CloudTrail service to do their day-to-day -day jobs, and so the administrator will need to provide them with the least privileged permissions. When creating policies to grant access to those different types of users, a helpful starting point is to use AWS managed policies and then modify them to your own custom use case by providing less access. And as you can see, we currently have three managed policies, including full access, read-only access, and service roles. For service admins, you could start with full access and then scale back as needed. And then for service users, you could start with read-only access and add or remove as needed. 
it's typically better to restrict more than you think will be needed and then to have the users request more access as they run into permissions issues until you get to just the right policy. As an example, your service administrators may need permissions to stop logging, start logging, get trail, etc. But a service user most likely shouldn't have access to stop logging. That's just really not something a service user needs to do to complete their tasks, and so there's no reason to give them that permission. That service user, however, may need to be able to use CloudTrail Lake in order to query for information, and so you should grant them access to specific event data stores. Apart from securing the CloudTrail service itself, we also need to secure CloudTrail logs. As we know, these get saved into Amazon S3, and so we can use both IAM policies and S3 bucket policies to control who can view, modify, or delete those logs. And as a best practice, you should be using a dedicated S3 bucket for your CloudTrail logs, meaning that you should not be mixing logs with other business data, as an example, because that makes securing the buckets a whole lot easier and AWS recommends the following S3 bucket policy. This gives permissions to the CloudTrail service to put objects into that S3 bucket. This policy by itself, however, would not grant read permissions to other users like service users. And maybe that's how you wanna keep it because you wanna force service users to read the logs through Lake, the API, or CloudWatch logs. But if a user needs to have read access directly in S3, then you'd have to add that permission to the bucket policy and potentially also to their user's IAM policy. So that's definitely something important to keep in mind. As I mentioned, AWS is a really complicated service to get right, and we only have so much time to cover it in this course. So for more in-depth information, please refer to this documentation. And once you're ready, go ahead and complete this lesson, and I'll see you in the next. The integrity of logs is extremely important. If you can't trust that the logs you're looking at are legitimate logs, then they become nearly useless. It's highly recommended that you enable CloudTrail log file integrity for any existing trails that you have, but this is a feature that is now enabled by default for new trails. By having it enabled, you can tell whether a log file was deleted, whether it was modified, or you can confidently say that it was unmodified since it's been delivered to Amazon S3. And it works by using SHA-256 for hashing and SHA-256 with RSA for digital signatures. With log file integrity, CloudTrail creates a hash for every log file that it delivers, and then every hour, it also creates a digest file that contains a hash of each of the log files which you can use to compare and make sure that the integrity of the log files is intact. CloudTrail also uses a private key that corresponds with a public key to sign each of the digest files in order to create a digital signature. And so this means that you can use the public key to validate the digest files and make sure that everything checks out. It is very important to keep in mind that when you enable this log file validation feature, all you're really doing is you're telling CloudTrail to generate the digest files that we just talked about. It is not actually validating the integrity of those log files. You have to do that either through the AWS CLI using the validate logs command, by using a third party solution, or by creating your own custom solution. So this is not a solution that you enable or a feature that you enable and that just assume that it means that your files have not been tampered with. As we wrap up, I recommend leaving log file validation enabled when you create new trails, and then I recommend using the validate logs API call whenever you need to investigate a potential security incident just to make sure that what you're looking at is legitimate. Then go ahead and complete this lesson, and I'll see you in the next. CloudTrail encryption is relatively straightforward, so we'll keep this lesson simple, but there are a couple of key concepts to understand. When people are talking about CloudTrail encryption, they're usually talking about encryption for data at rest, which means the data that's stored on AWS servers in their data centers. This type of encryption is important because it helps protect sensitive data from AWS employees being able to access it and see what it is in plain text, and or if anyone ever steals the storage drives from those data centers or as they're being discarded after their end of life. However, by default, it really doesn't protect your data beyond that. Whenever you are viewing the data in the AWS console or via the API, that data will be decrypted and in plain text. Or if you download it to a local device, that encryption at rest is not going to make sure 
that what you're downloading or as you're downloading it is in an encrypted format. By default, log files delivered by CloudTrail to S3 are encrypted by server-side encryption using Amazon S3 managed encryption keys, and this is referred to as SSE-S3. AWS instead recommends that you enable SSE-KMS, which is short for server-side encryption using AWS KMS keys. That way, you're in direct control of the encryption keys that are being used. To use this, you would first create a KMS key from the AWS KMS service, and you can configure CloudTrail to use that key when you are creating a trail or after the fact when you edit it. You just need to make sure that the key and the S3 bucket are residing in the same region. KMS keys have policies attached to them that determine who can use the key for encrypting and decrypting, and as long as the user is authorized, the encryption and decryption process is completely transparent. This is one of the main benefits of using SSE-KMS because now not only does a user have to have S3 read permissions for the bucket that contains the log files in order to access CloudTrail log files, which is what you would expect, but that user also needs to have a policy or a rule applied that allows decrypt permissions by the KMS key policy. And so we now have an extra layer of security, but that's it. I just wanted to quickly cover why you would want to consider using SSE-KMS, especially because KMS keys cost money, and then give you a brief explanation of how you would enable that. But let's go ahead and complete this lesson, and I'll see you in the next. Throughout this course, we've been talking about best practices for using CloudTrail and securing our trails and data. Understanding these best practices and implementing them in production can be two very different things, especially when you're busy with your day-to-day -day responsibilities and as your AWS environments grow in size and complexity. So to help make sure that we follow these best practices, let's take a look at a checklist. I created this checklist by taking what AWS Security Hub is doing behind the scenes and then putting it in a cheat sheet. Security Hub, if you're not familiar, is a service that we can enable to assess our AWS environments against security industry standards and best practices. So this service will collect data across your accounts and it will identify and prioritize security issues that it finds. Now in this case, by default, Security Hub looks for seven potential issues with CloudTrail deployments. Using this cheat sheet that I created and that you can download, you can keep this as a reference check to validate your CloudTrail deployments, and you can use this information to set up monitoring and alerting. Let's briefly walk through each of these one by one. The first one is CloudTrail.1, which says that CloudTrail should be enabled and configured with at least one multi-region trail that includes read and write management events. And the severity of this finding is considered high because if you don't have CloudTrail enabled for multi-region and for read-write management events, then you could have a threat actor carrying out an attack in a region that you never use and therefore never monitor, and you would have no idea that it's happening. Enabling this also helps ensure that AWS Global Services events are logged because some of the AWS services operate globally and not per region. To remediate this finding, you would create a new trail or update an existing trail to be multi-region, and you would check in management events that read and write are selected for API activity. With CloudTrail.2, which says that CloudTrail should have encryption at rest enabled, we have a severity of medium because by default, AWS already provides some encryption at rest for CloudTrail log data. However, they do recommend that you enable SSE-KMS, which stands for server-side encryption with AWS KMS keys for an added layer of security. Keep in mind that this encryption really only helps at rest, meaning that it will protect against physical access to the data, like if an AWS employee were to go rogue and try to access your private data, but it will not help prevent attackers from accessing your log data through the cloud. And that's why we have to have other controls for that situation. Next, we have CloudTrail.3, which says that CloudTrail should be enabled. Now, this finding has a severity of high because if you don't have CloudTrail enabled, you have little to no visibility into your AWS environments and resources. Now, personally, I think that this should be a critical finding instead of a high finding, but to remediate it, you would go in and you would create a trail just like I showed you. 
I also add in my cheat sheet that it is important to understand what's enabled by default ad account creation and what the difference is between management events, data events, and insights events, which you should now fully understand because you've gone through this course. For dot four, we have CloudTrail log file validation should be enabled. And the severity level here is low. And the reason is because you can implement security controls to protect your log files, making it very difficult for someone to delete or modify them, but it is still recommended that you enable log file validation. This creates a digitally signed digest file with a hash of each log that CloudTrail writes to in Amazon S3, which means that you can compare those digest files and see if the log files have been tampered with. You remediate this finding by enabling log file validation on all of your trails. Then we have dot five, which says that CloudTrail trails should be integrated with Amazon CloudWatch logs. Now this finding is considered a severity of low and the reason it's low, even though I highly recommend integrating with CloudWatch logs is because you can feed CloudTrail logs into other third-party solutions and still get similar results. You don't technically have to use CloudWatch logs, but in my opinion, you should use at least one solution to feed your logs into, even if that doesn't end up being CloudWatch and you remediate this by creating a CloudWatch logs group and then editing your trail to send logs to that group. With dot six, we wanna ensure the S3 bucket used to store CloudTrail logs is not publicly accessible. This is considered a critical severity finding because we need to ensure that the S3 bucket storing our logs is not accessible to the public. This one I think is fairly self-explanatory because logs contain a bunch of API and non-API activity, which will contain sensitive data. And that should never be publicly accessible. To remediate, just ensure that the S3 bucket blocks public access. Finally, we have a severity of low for CloudTrail.7, which says to ensure S3 bucket access logging is enabled on the CloudTrail S3 bucket. And this one is about ensuring that S3 bucket access logging is enabled. Access logging creates a log with access records for every request made to that S3 bucket. Those access logs contain details about the request type, the resources accessed, and date time of the request, so you can use this information for incident response and just to keep an eye on your logs. You can remediate this by enabling S3 bucket logging. So there you have it. You now have a checklist you can use to ensure that you're following CloudTrail security best practices, and you can feel free to download this cheat sheet and share it with anyone else who needs it. Then complete this lesson and I'll see you in the next. Congratulations, you've just completed our beginner's guide to CloudTrail for security course. This course was meant to give you a solid foundation and understanding of how CloudTrail works and how you can configure it for your use case and your organization. As a next step, I recommend learning how to use CloudTrail for threat detection and response. While we are going to release a course that teaches how to do this, in the meantime, practice creating potential scenarios and find ways of using all the features that you've just learned about to detect the threat and gather evidence as if you were doing it on the job. And if you need inspiration, then check out our exploitation courses at Cyber for ideas on various types of attacks that you could mimic in your account. But thank you so much for enrolling in my course, and I hope you enjoyed it.